Happy New Year and welcome to the Tax Roundup for February 2014 and what an interesting year of change it's going to be. You can follow the latest on superannuation and tax change from Knowledge Shop on Twitter. Now one of the biggest issues is often just knowing where change is up to. Mike Carruthers takes us through the latest in the government's plan of attack. We finally had some confirmation from the government around that big long list of announced but unlegislated tax amendments and tax measures. Um, just before Christmas we, we provided some clarity on exactly what is going to stay and what's going to go and the list of things that are going to stay is reasonably short but I guess the good thing is we now do have a bit of certainty around it. Um, just a highlight I guess in terms of some of the things that will be staying, um, the government has announced that the phase out of the net medical expenses tax offset will be going um, and we've actually now got legislation that's been draft legislation that's been introduced to deal with that particular measure. Um, the government has announced that which is really great news they will be proceeding with changing the earn out rules. So the way the CGT rules interact with earn out arrangements. Now this has been a real uncertain issue for a number of years now. Previous government announced some time ago, released some discussion papers around this. Um, the proposed changes make a whole lot of sense and will fix a lot of the problems that people are dealing with at the moment when it comes to figuring out how does CGT apply to an earn out arrangement. So the government has said that they will go ahead with that proposed look through treatment. Um, one of the other things that the government has planned to do is to continue with the the update to the going concern rules, farmland rules when it comes to GST. So rather than having a GST free treatment, it will be more a reverse charge treatment. So the purchaser will effectively charge themselves the GST and will claim the GST straight back if they meet all the relevant conditions. So a bit of a technical amendment, but it will just change the way that those rules operate. Now, importantly, it's also good to have a, have a think about the things that won't be proceeded with, um, some of the main ones being the self-education expenses deduction cap, that won't be staying, that's basically been gone. Um, the statutory formula method, that will stay, so the previous government had announced that would get rid of it, but that will stay. Um, and one of the other things that will be going is the proposed change to allow certain businesses to claim their R&D credits on a quarterly basis. Um, bad news for those who were, who were looking forward to that cash flow benefit, but that won't be staying. Now in terms of other things that are going on, um, just before Christmas I guess a lot of people were looking to see whether the mining tax repeal, bi repeal bills and the carbon tax bills um, would actually pass through the Senate. Um, bad news for the moment is that they haven't, which again leaves us in a bit of, bit of uncertain state because tied to the mining tax repeal bills were all the changes that were linked to it, things like changing the thresholds for small business depreciation, so the instant asset write-off threshold coming back down to $1,000, the removal of the immediate deduction for, for cars. Um, the start date for those things was meant to be 1 January this year. Um, that date has now passed, the legislation hasn't, hasn't been passed through the Senate, so not entirely sure at this stage whether that 1 January date will actually be the date. Um, we'll just have to wait and see. I mean, the government has told us that is the date they were planning to start it, so I'd, I'd keep that date well and truly at the front of your mind. Um, but we just do have to wait and see when and if these bills actually do pass through, exactly what the timing, timing will be around that. In rulings this month, there hasn't been a huge amount of activity because of the holiday period, but there was an important new draft ruling, 2013-D7, on the apportionment of expenses for self-managed super funds paying pensions. Adnan Sabay explains. This draft ruling is important for self-managed super funds that are paying pensions. The ruling really confirms what is current practice, but it just gives us some formal guidance from the ATO. As we know, deductions are only available against assessable income. Where a self-managed super fund is earning non-assessable income, in the case where it's paying out a pension, obviously deductions, deductions shouldn't be available. The ruling confirms that where deductions are paid or, or paid in respect of pension income, so the non-assessable part, no deduction should be available for that expense. The ruling then gives us some guidance on some of the more tricky aspects of expenses. Namely, where an expense is a general expense and really relates to earning accessible and non-accessible income, the ATO confirms that what you need to do is take an apportionment and claim a deduction only for the percentage that relates to the accessible income. 
Lastly, where a expense relates to both accessible and non-accessible parts, but the information surrounding the expense gives us guidance on what percentage we should be claiming, then the ATO confirms that you can use that different percentage provided you have some, some formal guidance. So as we said, this is really what we've been doing in the past, just gives us some formal guidance and, and something to stand on to make sure that we can substantiate and claim deductions against the accessible part of uh, accessible income of self-managed super funds which are paying pensions. In cases this month, Mike Carruthers takes us through a really interesting case exploring the control test for access to the CGT small business concessions. Now, following on the theme of cases dealing with the small business CGT concessions, uh, we've got another one which has kind of changed uh, probably some of the thinking around the control tests. Now, in this case, it was the Gutridge case which went before the tribunal. Um, the issue really at hand was whether a particular person was the controller of a discretionary trust. And this was quite crucial as to whether the, the trust could access the small business CGT concessions. Now, the situation was we had the taxpayer, who was basically the controlling mind of this particular trust, but did not have any formal title. So they weren't the appointer. The appointer of the trust was actually a, it was a, an advisor, so an accountant or other advisor. Um, and they also weren't one of the directors of the trustee company. Now, in this case, the director of the trustee company was a relative. And while they had the title and the position and the formal role, they argued that even though they, they had that role, they didn't actually exercise any real decision-making power when it came to the company which acted as trustee for this trust. So basically it looked at whether someone who is the director of a trustee company would automatically be taken to be the controller of the trust, or do you look more broadly than that? And basically what the tribunal found was that you do need to look beyond the formal titles and roles. Even though this, this relative was the director of the trustee company, they didn't make any decisions without consulting the taxpayer, who wasn't a director and wasn't the appointor. So basically what the tribunal found was you need to look at actually the substance. So who actually is influencing this trust? Who has power over the decision making that's being made? And the tribunal found it was actually the taxpayer, despite the fact that they had no formal role with the trust, with the trustee company either. Um, for the taxpayer in this case, that was a great result. It meant that they were able to pass the maximum net asset value test. That's what it all came down to. They were able to access the small business concessions. Now, the thing to be aware of here is that can go both ways. The control tests can be really helpful to you when you're trying to pass the active asset test. So you're trying to connect entities in terms of looking at whether assets are being used in the business of a connected entity. Um, but typically the control tests are, are your enemy when you're looking at the maximum net asset value test or the turnover test as well. So good one to keep in mind. I guess what we're seeing at the moment is that these rules get more and more complex. You need to look deeper and deeper into the issues um, and the real circumstances and the substance behind what's going on. It's not enough to just look at formal titles and roles. So another one just to keep them back in your mind when you are approaching the small business CGT concessions. Our last case looks at a taxpayer win on bona fide travel allowances. Adnan Sabay explains why the AAT upheld claims based on kilometres travelled. Gleeson versus the Commissioner of Taxation is a very, very important case for employees receiving bona fide travel allowances. The tribunal agreed that a travel allowance paid based on the distance travelled by an employee was still a bona fide travel allowance for the purposes of the, com the concessions available. Now you remember, where an employee is receiving a bona fide travel allowance, they're entitled to claim food expenses and accommodation expenses without keeping um, receipts, provided they um, are below the or provided the deductions are below the commissioner's reasonable rates. Now the commissioner tried to argue that because the allowance was based on distance travelled rather than expenses incurred or expected to be incurred, the commissioner argued that they weren't, or the, the allowance wasn't a bona fide travel allowance. The good news here is that the tribunal said, no, nah, that's not correct, you're definitely entitled to, a bona, to the concessions, even if it's based on distance travelled, provided you keep those travel diaries to, to substantiate where you've been and, and what area you've been um, travelling in. 
2014 is going to be a really interesting year and it would be more important than ever to keep up with change. Knowledge Shop can help you do exactly that with our accountants training. Coming up we have the contractor versus employee versus the ATO webinar on the 20th of February. We have business valuation basics for all those looking to get into and refine how they do business valuations. For all those in the leadership of practices, we have Future Proof Your Practice, a strategic workshop led by Greg Hayes. And also we have Tax and Business Services Basics, which is our graduate new accountants refresher training course, absolutely essential to do things right the first time. You can find all the details on Knowledge Shop's website. Just come and see us at knowledgeshop.com.au. See you next month.